excited for this next panel. We have uh, the prestigious law firm Fox Rothschild, who's going to come here today with some of their best attorneys and talk about a whole uh, swath of amazing topics that really affect us and that really impact exactly the things that we need to know. So I'd like to welcome out on stage Mark Connaught, Chris Beal, Brian Rothery, and Imran Faruqi. So what's really awesome is that Fox Rothschild has really been doubling down. As you can see, we have you know, four gentlemen here who are very well dressed, very smart, <laughs> very good at their jobs, who are here to, uh, to really talk about all these different, each one of them has a different subspecialty when it comes to law. Uh, and uh, you know, that kind of very particular knowledge is what we're gonna delve into here today. So, um, and we'll do a little bit of a Q&A after and then once we're done with this panel, uh, at just before one o'clock, these guys will be in the lobby, so if you have any particular questions for them, you can feel free to talk to them. Uh, so first things first, what is going on? Like, what can we do anymore, not do anymore? 333s, 107 flyover people, new administration, regulations, not regulation, what is going on with drone law right this second? And, and that's the challenge. I mean, right now you've got the situation with the new administration, what I would call, they don't call it a moratorium, but whatever you want to call the executive order that basically says no new regulations unless you can repeal or vacate two existing regulations. And as opposed to most industries, the drone industry is sitting there saying, give us some regulations. Certainly they don't want to be overregulated, but give us some regulations. So right now the challenge is that you all realize Operations over people and beyond visual line of sight are the two biggest challenges in the drone industry right now. And while part 107 says they can grant waivers, you can also still use the 333 process for beyond that, is that since August when they said, look, we'll permit waivers for these things in the right circumstances, they've granted one waiver for operations over people and four waivers for beyond visual line of sight. And there are some significant restrictions on those waivers as well. And so you've got notices of proposed rule making that have not yet been publicized that are on the internal process where they have to vet within the executive branch, make sure that everyone's okay with it before they announce it to the public. So if you remember back in February of 15 was the notice of proposed rule making for part 107, which then we didn't know what it was finally going to look like. We knew what the framework was until June of 2016 and then became effective in August of 2016. We're not even yet at the point to where they have publicized the notice of proposed rulemaking. So it took 14, 15, 16 months to go from a notice of proposed rulemaking that's publicized until the regulations, we knew what they looked like and became effective last summer. And so we are not even yet at the point to where they've done the notice of proposed rulemaking and publicized it. And no one knows for certain even what those proposed regulations for operations over people and beyond visual line of sight look like yet. And that's the challenge is everyone's up in the air with the current administration as to what's going to happen. There is a provision for the director of the Office of Management and Budget. I'm getting a little techy here. But to make exceptions to that executive order. And there has been a request by the small UAV coalition, which is made up of a lot of the major players, the Amazon Prime Air, the Google, Verizon, Walmart's part of that, urging the Office of Management and Budget to say, make a limited exception for these proposed rules in the area of drones. But that's, the landscape right now is, we have part 107, we, you have a mechanism to seek a waiver for things outside of part 107, it's just not very many of them are being granted for operations over people or beyond visual line of sight, which is what people really want to do, particularly the beyond visual line of sight. Can you just clarify uh, for all of us, and especially me, what the deal is like? Where are 333s and 107s living? How do they intersect? I'm sure there's people here. Who has a 107 here? 333? Okay, so I guess was one person with 333. So I guess it's not really that relevant for this crowd, but uh, I guess with 107s, can you just take us through uh, any kind of like real red flags right now, things we should be aware of, uh, people especially that had that before the new administration? What's, what's, what are our concerns? 
Well, certainly that you're operating within those, you know, within the 107 parameters, that you know, you're not doing the operations over people, that you're observing the 400 feet requirement, and you know, whether that's 400 feet radius of a structure or over the top of a structure, which was, it's not just 400 feet altitude, you can be within 400 feet of a structure. Um, those sorts of things are the red flags of if the FAA sees somebody operating outside of those, that's going to be the challenge. Operations over people, something that's a nighttime operation. Any of those are going to be the ones that are instantly going to trigger concern from the FAA. How aggressive they're going to be on the enforcement is anybody's guess. Uh, they, they sort of run that line of they don't want a catastrophe. And so the FAA doesn't want to be, you know, grant a waiver for operations over people and have something terrible happen and then the egg is on their face, so to speak. And so they're very reticent on that. But for operators now, you can still go the 333 route if you so chose. I mean, depending upon what weight limit you wanted to do or various other things. Um, but you know, most people are seeking a waiver under Part 107 to those specific restrictions if they want to do some limited operations over people, something beyond what Part 107 permits you to do. So there's an entire waiver process as part of Part 107. The 333s, if you had a 333 prior to Part 107, that 333 can remain effective or you can get it converted over. Um, the good thing was, at least with the 333s, once they started authorizing those for a certain class of drones, then the entire class would be, you know, granted in. So the question now is, is with Part 107, if they grant an exemption or a waiver, what, is somebody else going to be able to basically cookie cutter and use that same exemption and waiver, which has been the argument. A lot of people will go to those waivers that have been granted, just like they did with 333s and cut and paste. Um, the challenge with the operations over people beyond visual line of sight, and some of the more technical ones, is that a lot of that is trade secret and proprietary, so they'll let them redact that parts out. So anything in that exemption waiver that's been granted, it's, it's difficult to find much of the information in there that you could cut and paste and use. Right. Chris, you know, one of the uh, films this year is, uh, that we're gonna see later tonight is, um, was shot uh, by these guys, these Native Americans uh, at Standing Rock, the yep. North Dakota Pipeline. Can you talk to me about your First Amendment considerations and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of shots in that of like the police or some kind of security shooting sure. drones down, like, sure. uh, where are we standing with that these days? So, um, First Amendment applies, uh, at least in the United States, uh, and that means that the government uh, cannot uh, unreasonably restrict your ability to convey the content that you film with a drone or small UAV. Um, it, and this is a distinction that matters from a First Amendment point of view. The First Amendment says nothing about the government's ability to regulate the, um, the licensing of the drone and the drone operator, but it says a lot about what the government can do to uh, restrict your dissemination, publication, the content of what you film. So, for example, um, the government could and did uh, restrict the ability of drone operators at uh, Standing Rock in where they could film, how high they could go, uh, when they could go, nighttime, you needed a waiver. Um, but with regard to what was captured, police officers' faces. Many police officers feel it is uh, a risk to their personal safety to capture a police officer's face uh, for various reasons. Um, the First Amendment protects a journalist or a cinematographer from gathering that kind of information. So the distinction is about um, the mechanics of the machine used to capture the film versus what's on the film. The First Amendment protects what's on the film. First Amendment may not protect what uh, the, the mechanics, the licensing of the operation of the machine. The other thing to um, th think about is it's not just federal regulation, it's also local regulation, and we are encountering some private regulation. Um, and there's an interesting question. You should always be um, afraid. Run for the hills when a lawyer says it's an interesting question. Because um, <laughs> that means there's a lot to talk about. Um, uh, there's an hours. <laughs> yeah, there's an interesting question about whether or not the FAA 
uh, federal regulations of the airspace, and we believe this to be true, uh, preempts, uh, prevents local regulation. So we had a wave of communities passing local ordinances allegedly prohibiting use of drones within the community. Um, I think it's pretty well settled that those regulations are unconstitutional, that the FAA, not unconstitutional, that they're preempted um, by the FAA's regulations. But we still have local police officers who think that it is within their power they set up a police barricade. They, they um, see somebody operating a drone, and they think it's within their right to go take the drone, to confiscate the drone, and to confiscate the film. Um, what I think everybody here should know is that you have a constitutional and statutory right to preserve the film that you have gathered in a news gathering operation. And you can actually sue the government for money um, if the uh, law enforcement agency <laughs> if the law enforcement agency takes your film. There are a couple of cases in which the Secret Service got hung up um, by going after journalists who had taken pictures of political candidates and, and what have you, but they had confiscated the film, and there is protection around that. So, What, what should you do uh, if you are if that does happen to you, how should you behave? Because I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure you guys too. You see it come up in your Facebook feed all the time, where it's like somebody sitting in a car, cop says, "I want to come in," and they're being very polite about the fact that they don't want to come out and they should stop filming, stuff like that. Right. Obviously, you know, being combative with you know uh, somebody, even if it's not their right. So, what should we do if you are flying? You're flying in a legal right. spot, and somebody does want to confiscate, or if you're flying, I don't know. You tell me. Right. So, the the first <laughs> advice uh, I, as a lawyer, give to cinematographers and journalists is even when the order given is unconstitutional, is unreasonable, is beyond the law, the enforcement officer's authority, comply. Because you will be arrested for non-compliance um, if you mouth off, if you re refuse to comply. Um, you have remedies after the execution of an unconstitutional order. You can. It doesn't solve the problem for you because there may be in that moment when the officer's interfering with your ability to gather the film, an event that you need to be filming. And, and so he is interfering in your First Amendment rights. The remedy for that is a lawsuit against the officer and the officer's agency. As a, but that remedy isn't going to help you because what you want is the film. Right. What I'm uh, suggesting is if you continue to um, disregard a law enforcement officer's order, you're more likely to be arrested than not. Um, and the only way to solve that problem is to comply and take action afterwards. Um, having continued to disregard an enforcement officer's uh, order and gotten yourself arrested, the next thing we care about is getting you out of jail. Um, quickly. Um, and um, in that regard, to the extent that any of you all are in, engaged in f filming in a high profile event, Dakota Ridge, um, it, right, Standing Rock, anything, um, you should always, when you're going into that scenario, have a lawyer's phone number um, in your pocket. Um, the whole idea that you get one phone call. Um, you may only get one phone call, but what is most important is that we get you out before you do things like say something that makes it worse um, as quickly as possible. Um, what is the best way to document something like that in the event that it happens? Because I'm assuming that if you do want to press charges, if something, if, if your mission is kind of uh, terminated. Right, so one of the things that is happening, at least with news organizations, is um, especially network organizations, are beginning to go out with two-person teams. Um, and we'll have an operator and we'll have a person who is the, uh, there who might, you might have a drone operator and a video operator or you might have a drone operator who is also doing the video and somebody who is standing around. What I want as a lawyer is I want the, uh, as much evidence as I can get of the interaction. So this is the moment you whip out your cell phone and you take video of what's going on. It is in fact true that you have a constitutional right to um, make a film of police. Um, to the extent that they try to confiscate the film, this gets back to the point 
law enforcement cannot do that, or they can, but then you can sue them. So what we want is um, the kind of video that you see people posting to Facebook of these interactions with police. And the next thing I want is everybody to keep their cool, um, to not lose their temper, um, because that makes you look bad. Um, and at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is making you look good and making the law enforcement officer who's getting in the way of your First Amendment rights make that person look bad. Right. Okay. Good. Brian, let's, let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. Um, I deal with a lot of racing frame designers, people that are just innovating, and it's really interesting because it seems to me like it's kind of the Wild West. Who builds their own gear? So, I mean, you know, it's like we're all kind of, you know, we all buy our parts in various places. It just seems to me like there's just no protection whatsoever, you know, I mean, and people don't even try. I mean, some people try, you know, I mean, I just heard a post the other day about somebody that's been developing antennas for a while and they've gone through patenting processes and things like that. Um, talk to me about the state of intellectual property in the drone world right now. So, and it's not much different than other industries that have grown, you know, to the point where they are, automotive industry, motorcycles. It's new, it's in its infancy, it is the Wild West. Uh, it's borrowing technologies from other areas. Uh, there's another, a number of mechanisms by which you can protect your innovations. Um, you have patents, um, you have trade secrets, you have trademark for your reputation, you have copyrights, and you also have uh, trade secrets and contracts. Um, for those who are building their own stuff, um, there's, depending upon the technology or what you're actually, you know, it's a bunch of parts that you're assembling, where is the innovation that you're adding to progress the sciences? And that's going to depend, what you're doing is going to depend perhaps on the avenue that you're going to choose. You have, as I said, patents, and there are design patents which will cover your ornamental features, your design, basically what, what, it, what it looks like. Uh, you have utility patents that will cover the technology innovations, whether it be materials, uh, flight systems, communications, um, all those different materials, all those aspects of the structural design, the mechanics, the mechanisms, is, uh, Chris had referred to. Um, you have copyright, you have software. Actually, patents will cover, potentially cover your, your software as well. Um, you have copyrights, which will cover the software as well. Usually, if you can get the patent, it'll provide you a little bit better protection than perhaps the copyright. Uh, it could be harder to get. Um, there are um, uh, trade secrets, trade secrets, uh, usually you want to look for something that can't be reverse engineered, so a lot of trade secrets is more directed towards manufacturing or how you actually build it or put it together. Um, there's contract depending upon what you're doing as well, whether you're working with other people in, in building for them, uh, know-how, covering know-how, protecting know-how. Um, and so those are the various avenues, and, and then there's uh, one area that I want to discuss is with utility patents is applications. New applications, new um, uses for drones that, that people are thinking about. Um, again, the area that's probably best suited for that would be patents. Um, there's a lot of um, flux in the law right now in terms of you have to watch whether or not it's an abstract idea. So you need to have something like concrete, not just a, a thought in your mind, but a way of doing it and accomplishing that feat. Uh, one thing I would look for, as I said, is it seems to be um, the development is taking from a lot of different industries, whether it be materials for the, from the aerospace, communications from uh, computers and interfaces. Um, so when you do have a new use, I would look to um, at what is the technological tweak that you're giving it to facilitate that new use and try and capture that in your patent as well. So you would look at the method, protecting the method, also looking at the combination, what is the technological advance that's helping facilitate this particular innovation and looking to patent that as well. Um, patents can be more expensive, copyrights are cheaper to obtain. Um, trade secrets, it's a matter of protecting it, but again, all these different 
um, laws, avenues, mechanisms are directed towards um, a particular aspect of the innovation. One thing I forgot to mention was also trademarks. So you can, you can protect your name, your reputation. So if you're known in the industry for being well at maybe antenna design, as you indicated, you, know, you, want, you want to protect that, that reputation. The other area of trademarks, a little harder to obtain, is on the actual look and feel, the design, the configuration of your, your drone, uh, your UAV, in terms of um, that has a certain look that people identify with you. You have to obtain secondary meaning. It usually takes time to build up that reputation and get that kind of protection. Right. Imran, Every person in this room that shoots is eventually going to be hired to do some kind of shoot for somebody. Uh, and there's a lot of different elements that have to, to that, that play into that. Um, you know, starting with when you shoot for somebody, you know, uh, or is this just work for hire and they own the footage? Do you own the footage? Sometimes, do you own the footage that you're shooting when you're just testing things out before? Um, just in general, what are the most important things for a cinematographer, an aerial cinematographer, to uh, understand or to, to make clear with production companies before they jump into a production? Sure. Well, the interesting thing is with the advent of drone technology being used more frequently in motion picture productions, particularly uh, in documentaries and features, the driving engine behind these projects still remains the same, and that is ultimately distribution. And for any production, regardless of the type of content they're creating, to get distribution, any uh, distributor is going to require certain deliverables. And among them will be a very clear chain of title. So with regards to who owns the rights um, with respect to footage, Generally, it's almost always going to be a work-for-hire scenario. So if you're a drone operator, you can expect that your, your agreement with a production company will be very clear and specify. You will shoot from this date to this date. You will have um, only a certain amount of space to shoot in. You have a very set location. And all of the services that you do during that time frame and in that place, no matter what you've captured, will be automatically owned as a work for hire, like you said, by the production company. And what work for hire really means, uh, legally speaking, is that any of the footage that's captured from the inception that it's created automatically is owned by the production company. And that's a very standard thing to be aware of. So um, if there are certain uh, uses that maybe you as an operator want to reserve, for instance, it's not uncommon that a lot of uh, cinematographers have uh, you know, portfolio or demo reels and things like that that they like to use uh, to try to gain uh, employment after. Uh, so let's say you want to throw up some of the clips that you captured on your, on your personal website or you want to be able to you know, send that to uh, potential employers. That's something that you would have to negotiate and carve out of your agreement uh, because as a work for hire, the production company owns all of the rights exclusively, and so you would need to get permission to use it, um, to use, make any use of that after the fact. So that's something you would want to think about and negotiate up front when entering into an agreement like that. And I, I would say in addition to the chain of title, as far as distribu uh, distributors are concerned, uh, the other most important thing is just a lack of third-party claims. Um, whether that be from the, uh, the, the operators, the owners of the camera equipment, whatever it is, the production is going to want to be sure that they are covered and they're not going to, do, they're not going to incur any additional liability by in using you as an operator for, their, you know, for the camera uh, or uh, have any other issues with regards to the equipment itself. So in that sense, from the perspective of the uh, for those of you who are actual operators of drones, when you're engaging with a production company, it would be in your best interest to actually negotiate that you be added to the production's general liability uh, insurance policy as well as their errors and omissions policy. That way you are covered 
um, from any third party claims as a result of the distribution of the film. At the same time, the production company is gonna want you to be responsible for ensuring that uh, you're going to use the, the gear in a manner that's not going to uh, be outside the scope of what their insurance will cover if there is an accident. Obviously with drones, the types of footage uh, and the nature of flying is a lot more risky than a, a typical uh, you know, camera rig that you might rent from Panavision. So with that, there's a lot, there's a lot more uh, uh, risk elements that need to be addressed uh, through insurance. So that is certainly um, a consideration to make sure that um, A, that you are protected by the production and the production company will also want you to be, uh, to use the gear in a manner that's gonna keep them within the lines of their policy as well. We should, we should also mention a couple of things about um, the people in, in your filming um, to the extent that you're uh, capturing identifiable images of human beings, you're gonna want model releases um, in, in part because your film might be used later for some commercial purpose. So you shoot film, it gets uh, worked into a feature film uh, the producers of the feature film, the production company, something, they want to take an, uh, a clip of that and use it for a trailer. The trailer is now promotion, it's advertising. That's a fundamental difference in use, and uh, we want to make sure that the release of the person, that you got somebody, if you got somebody in the film, we want that person to sign away their rights um, so that we can <laughs> use their image however we want to use it. You know, this, this brings up like an interesting question because for me, honestly, every time I have to talk to a lawyer, it makes me a little bit nervous only because once, you know, I like to like keep everything checked off and, you know, you have to do that when you fly drones to make sure you're flying safely and batteries and all that stuff that you need to do, right? But once you talk about the legal stuff, you really like, you're jumping down the rabbit hole that that could be kind of endless. You know, Lori Landu from your guys' firm was here last year and she was talking about exactly that, you know, getting all the clearances from everybody that's on the screen and then every, all the buildings and making sure that you're, so it's like, what is the, like, the minimum viable, reasonable and responsible for those of us that can't, can't, frankly, that just can't afford every single time to have counsel go over, you know, because my guess is that the majority of people here are not shooting for like Transformers 3 where it's like, okay, fine, you know, it's like a big enough contract where you have to do that. So if you're shooting for for homes or for, you know, or for smaller commercials, productions, things like that. Like, what are the, the couple of basic things that you think are the most important? Because, you know, the, like, you know, shooting a building, the chances are that you're not gonna, nobody's gonna come after you for that. Uh, for certain productions, you'll wanna have that cover, but what do we need that's just covering your behind? I think at an initial level, it, you know, each of us have our own level of risk we're willing to deal with, but it comes down to the risk sort of benefit. And on one side of it, I mean, I do a lot of litigation. And what I see oftentimes is people who, for the sake of a few thousand dollars, potentially, could have consulted a lawyer and had things in place and didn't. And now, once it switches to the side of litigation, it's hundreds of thousands, if not you know, seven figures of legal fees that might have been averted at the minimum. But no, it's an excellent question, Randy, as far as Thank you. You know, where's your risk tolerance? <laughs> And what are you willing to do and what's it for? But I mean, I think insurance, certainly out of the box. And make sure you, you, you look at the policy or have a lawyer or even an agent walk through the policy. One thing that's important is do a letter to your insurance agent or broker. Say, this is what I intend to do with my drone. You know, these sorts of things. Operating within part 107, you know, will I be covered? This is the coverage I want. Because one side of it is, is if the insured or the potential insured seeking the insurance didn't specifically ask for it and they give you a blanket policy that's riddled with exceptions and exclusions, you don't read that, most of us don't. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what exclusions are in my homeowner's policy. You know, I know generally what probably is in there, but I don't sit and read those. I mean, the insurance company typically doesn't negotiate those, but if you have some specific use and you've asked for that coverage and they just give you their standard policy, and it excludes that coverage that you're seeking or for what you need, now you've got a claim against your insurance company. They're either gonna cover it or if you have to go back against your insurance company, but out of the box, a policy that's gonna cover you. 
certainly like what they discussed, the, 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 the production releases, so that you, know, you either own your content or have some right to use that content in something because that's important to you. And so sometimes it's walking through these for the first time with an attorney to say, okay, what are some of the things I should look for? What's an agreement I could use? I don't want to sit up here and tell you to cut and paste what an attorney used, but we have a lot of clients that do that, that you know, spend that initial time to go through, and some of it's a sort of a growth process. You might start with the insurance policy, depending on what you're doing. You might have a production agreement that works for you, that reserves certain rights to you. The release side of it, you know, certainly if you think it's something that you're probably never going to be used again, or likelihood is that it would never be used for a promotional purpose, you know, I'm not going to tell somebody to look the other way, but maybe that's not such, a, such an immediate concern. Or if it is, try and get some of those model releases in so that you have the right to use that, or you're going to have to do something to, you know, blur those images or otherwise so that they're not shown in there. But I mean, I, you know, you may have additional suggestions, the three of you, but I think at the outset, some operative set of documents that you can look at and use and some idea along with the insurance policy so that you've got some minimum threshold of coverage that permits you to do what you want to accomplish. So let me ask you another question. So I mean, I'm sure nobody here has crashed a drone. I mean, like, we, nobody crashes <laughs> no, drones, never. especially in professional <laughs> contexts. Um, sometimes somebody will have a hard landing, but um, Let's just say that you're one of these outliers who crashes a drone on a production. What do you, uh, you know, it's kind of a similar question to the police one before. What do you do first? Obviously, I know it's going to be to call you guys, but what's the, what's the best course of action in case something like that were to happen, which I know is very rare? Well, the, uh, the first question I have is, um, did anybody get hurt? Because I, I, I want people to be human, and I want people to be uh, caring. And so if somebody gets hurt, the first thing you should do is take care of that. Um, let's just say yes. Let's call it a worst-case scenario. Right. I mean, well, not worse. So, I mean, but yeah, let's say worst, because, I mean, right. you know, so, what's, what are you doing So somebody gets hurt, let's, let's take care of the blood, and, and let's get the injury taken care of. Um, then suppose, let's build a hypothetical here. This, is, this was on a closed set. You were filming for a production company. The production company has some sort of cast of hundreds um, and you were uh, filming over those people um, and you didn't get a waiver um, for filming over those people because you thought this was a closed set and I can do this even though the FAA says you shouldn't. Um, By the way, is over directly over? Let's just be clear for one second. We're talking about directly over. It's flying right over my head, but it can be flying right there. No? Right. Well, that, that, that's, that's in the interpretation of the rules. The rules say you cannot fly over human beings. And I think at some point, the strict interpretation of that means that if you're five feet off a vertical ceiling, then you're not flying over the human beings. I mean, but can you stand up in a court of law? I always say when it comes down to drone stuff for me personally, I'm willing to do things or not do things based on what I'd be willing to do, say under oath. Right. You know, at so, certain times there's a, a pilot who's a liability, and I'll take the controller even right. though I'm not necessarily, you know. But it's I, I would be comfortable standing up for that. So, so I, I, would you be comfortable trying to explain to a judge, oh, I was five feet off, and the judge says to you, but you knew the wind was four four miles per hour, and so you knew the wind could blow the drone into the crowd that you were shooting at. Um, I think at that point a judge is going to think you were over human beings and would conclude that you had violated the regulation. We have yet to see an actual prosecution of this issue. Um, and knock, I, knock wood that it does not happen. Yeah. I, and, and believe you, I, I absolutely believe it has happened and I, we just haven't uh, heard about it. Technically under the regulations you're supposed to report to the FAA when, you've ha when you have an incident. So one of the things that you're supposed to do is uh, make a report to the FAA when there has been uh, an accident. Um, you should also um, clearly be reporting to your insurance carrier if you've got insurance. Um, what you ultimately want to do is um, not become the cause celebre for the people who want to come after the drone industry. I'm here to tell you that there are politicians who would love to make somebody a martyr um, and go after you for flying a drone in an unsafe manner and see these kids are always doing this stuff, we have to clamp down. 
Um, and so one of the concerns that many media companies today have is being the example. And so their uh, media companies are aggressively uh, restrictive about what they're doing because they want to not be the example um, that is made. But ultimately, if there is an accident, you need to, one, take care of whoever's been hurt, two, follow the law, which means make, make a report, and um, figure out why it happened. Um, what, what went, we're still in this uh, uh, time where we're learning. Um, this is a brave new world, and we should figure out why accidents happen. And I would just add to that, Chris, that, and this unfortunately happens often in the aviation industry in general, general aviation. Some incident happens, the pilot doesn't say a word to the FAA. I mean, they've learned that don't, don't talk about the facts of what happened. So if there's any law enforcement there, certainly as Chris said, if there's injury to person, take care of that. Don't say I'm sorry, don't apologize, just take care of the issue. Resolve the immediate personal injury problem that's there. Zip your lip. <laughs> Report it to your insurance broker. Talk to your attorney about reporting it to the FAA and then decide what you're gonna do because whatever statements are made there in the heat of the moment, and, and we all, I mean, there's that natural compunction I'm of sorry. people. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm right. sorry, and then if somebody comes along and says, how did that happen? You're still trying to piece it together in the adrenaline of the moment, and you start spurting things out that might be perfectly legitimate, but then under cross-examination by a prosecutor or someone else, the personal injury attorney and starts to parse out the context of that statement and take it out of context, you will live to regret it. So as strong as that urge is to you know, make the apology come clean, tell everybody what happened, resist it. My, and my three, don't three... say it on Facebook, even though you <laughs> think that you have a private network. My, my three-year-old would apparently be a really good uh, drone pilot because she never says I'm sorry about anything. <laughs> um, so let, I, I want to ask one more question, and then I want to turn it over for a couple minutes to questions, and then you guys can, these guys are going to go outside and please harass them and, you know, um, you know pump them for knowledge. Uh, but I get constant uh, calls about licensing footage, footage that I've shot, uh, you know, more often than not just kind of, you know, footage that I was taking when I was like flying at the park, you know, sometimes on like the east side that's not in B-class airspace, but like, you know, I'm like flying just for fun and like I happen to be shooting and I'm flying within certain rules or, you know, I mean, what's the deal with that? Uh, and and specifically if, if it wasn't a clear production day where you were out there shooting like you would be on a commercial shoot where everything's cleared, you were just there as a, you know, as a hobbyist and you happen to capture footage, you put that online, somebody, I mean, that's happened to me a million times already. Uh, so what, are the, what, what do we, should we watch out for in that particular case? You mean you wanna? Sure, well, I, I think it, this touches upon what, you know, what we were speaking, speaking about before with regards to clearances and being worried about, you know, the subjects who you may have captured during this sort of hobby flyby that you might be working on. So before you actually enter into a license agreement for somebody where you're actually, that becomes then a commercial transaction where you are, uh, you know, receiving compensation in exchange for the footage, uh, you would want to be sure that you have rights to clear that first. So that's as far as people in the frame. For people in the frame. What about your location at the particular time? Remember, I was flying well, as a hobbyist, so I'm not like, you know, this is not something that I went to the mayor's office of film and television to ask for permission for. You didn't get right. a permit, right. Well, certainly, certain, and, and uh, again, and you know, a lawyer's favorite response to many questions is that it depends, <laughs> which everyone loves to hear. But what that really means is that it really does depend on the location that you are shooting in. So, for instance, if you happen to be um, just flying around maybe downtown and you caught the Freedom Tower and something else, and depending on the proposed license usage of that footage, you may have to clear, uh, in addition to people who may be identifiable in the imagery, but you may have to also clear certain trademark rights, like what Brian was talking about, because certain buildings may have trademark rights or copyrightable elements that need to be cleared. And again, depending on the proposed license usage that you're selling this for, um, that could be a, a real issue. So, 
that I was going to say, Brian, I'm, I'm curious about the question that you've received, or when you, you said you get these requests all the time for licensing of your footage. Do you, um, when you agree, I assume that you agree, um, for use, do you make it non-exclusive? Do you retain the rights? Yes. Right. I mean, so, I have in the past, yeah. Right. So one of the things that Emmy's talking about is um, the, making sure that you have the ability to grant permission to the person who's asking, but the other thing that you want to think about is retaining. Right. Um, what is it that you want to hold on to? The ability to use it yourself. Um, do you want to impose on the person who's asking time limits? Um, so this is what Emmy was talking about in terms of the nature of the use that's being requested. Not only is it, the, the, is it a commercial use, is it a non-commercial use, but for how long? In what mediums? In what distribution channels? How, uh, how are they going to use it? And you can impose, because you own the content, you can impose restrictions that will protect you downstream. And to, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, and you know, building upon that, once you start getting into those mechanics as far as what types of uses you are going to license for, you can, the benefit of that is if it's going to be, let's say it's a motion picture production, they're saying, hey, this looks great, we want to use this as an intro montage for that leads into the film. You can say, well, that's great, I'll give this to you for festival uses only and for a certain fee. And if you want any rights beyond that, then we're going to bump up the fee at certain levels, depending on what your exploitation is. So there's a lot of room you have to negotiate that, being the, the owner of the footage. Uh, so. Yeah, and, and I think the time limit and scope is important because, particularly in today's society, we're often shocked by what goes viral and what doesn't. And so if you grant some sort of blanket or, limited li or unlimited license for somebody to use, and three years from now it explodes in another medium, I mean, you have the opportunity to restrict the time frame and the medium in which that could be, could, could be broadcast or could be put out to the world that now you have the ability to profit from that viral side of it rather than the entity to which you granted the license to. So I mean, think about that even if it's somewhat more routine is you should always be somehow circumscribing the extent of the license that you're granting. Awesome. All right, we have time for one question and then these guys will be outside. Does anybody have a question? <laughs> Not, that, not that's been reported. <laughs> um, so whether or not that's happened, I mean, I think as Chris mentioned, even though we haven't seen the issues in the news where somebody has literally had a drone come out of the sky and, and, and hurt somebody, I'm sure that's happened on limited occasions, probably amongst friends or families, and it wasn't a serious injury or somehow got covered up because nobody wanted to say anything. And, and, and knock on wood, there hasn't been a major one yet. But as far as we know, no, and the hope is, is that knock on wood, it, it never happens, but the likelihood is it will happen at some point, is the further we get down the road, the more accepting the public is becoming of drones in general. I mean, I think five years ago, people's, most people's view of drones was still the military focus, that these are the things in Afghanistan or Somalia taking people out. People have started to become more accepting of at least the concept. There's still a long ways to go before the general public recognizes the capabilities of the technology. But the further we can get down the road before that incident, which I don't think is unfortunately not a matter of if, it's more a matter of when, the less, I think, public backlash there will be at that point, once the public begins to see the uses of the drones, where if it would have happened five years ago, I think it would have been incredibly devastating. Even today, it would be devastating, but I don't think at the level it was. So as time goes on, you know, at least for the industry as a whole, the catastrophe is going to happen, unfortunately. But you know, hopefully, it's minimized, and hopefully, it's you know, none of us even inadvertently. Thank you, Mark, Chris, Brian, Thank you. Imran. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to thank Fox Rothschild for being here today. Once again, uh, they're going to be out front for you guys to talk to. And uh, yeah, if you guys need any kind of counsel, these guys are certainly uh, amazing. And not only that, but in case they cannot handle your exact problem, they can pass you along. Their firm is huge. They're all over the country. So thank, thank you. you guys Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. All right, so we did one panel. Uh, we have two more panels coming up, really, really exciting. So this next one, uh, I'm going to jump back there, talk to them, get ready. So just chill out. In 15 minutes, uh, we'll be back again. 
Uh, you guys can go outside, there's VR experience outside, there's free drinks and all kinds of other things to do and, and whatnot. Uh, we have coming up next is Ty Evans and Philip Bloom, who are going to talk about pushing the creative boundaries with drones. Uh, thank you all for coming. We'll see you guys in 15 minutes. <laughs>